Well, good morning, Covenant City Church. It is a, a true pleasure to be with you. Thank you for your warm welcome. Tazar, thank you for that warm welcome. I do still have grades uh, in my laptop, so I can pull it up and see how well you did. Uh, but you said some nice things there, so that'll help you out. Um, I do bring greetings from the saints in Washington, D.C., including three saints in particular who you, many of you all know well, Gray and Indita Sutanto, and of course, baby Kiandara, who we refer to as the queen, um, who was uh, born there in the last year. Uh, it's, it's been a joy to have them, and I do recognize even bringing them up is a dangerous thing, because we took them from you, but they have been a true blessing. Let me tell you that CCC's uh, influence and people are being felt around the world, and they have been a true blessing to us at RTS Washington. I also bring you greetings from the leadership of Reformed Theological Seminary, where I serve uh, from its board and from its chancellor, Ligon Duncan. They send their greetings as well, and we're clear to me, make sure you say hi for us when you are at CCC. Our text this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Galatians. This is chapter 2 of Galatians, the letter to the Galatians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Galatians 2, 1 through 10. You have it there in your bulletin. And here it is. Then, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure that I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they may bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission, even for a moment." so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, They gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing that I was so eager to do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do lift up the reading of your word. We thank you that you're a God who reveals himself, that we don't need to climb to the top of a mountain or swim to the bottom of the ocean or go to a faraway planet to find your word to us, but you have given it to us, that we have it here in your word, and we see it most perfectly in the person of Jesus Christ. So as we come to your word, Lord, I pray that you would, by the power of your spirit, enable us to rightly hear it as the word of God, that we'd rightly evaluate it as the words of life for us. Dear Lord, I pray that you'd also help us to understand it as we span these thousands of years to this very specific situation that Paul writes about, Lord. I pray that we would understand it as those who come to hear about their Savior. I pray, Lord, as we consider all of these things, that we would see Christ afresh, that we would see Christ anew. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Now, this is an interesting passage. I I, I don't suspect that many of you count this as one of your life verses, uh, any passage from this section. It's not very much, it's not a very commonly referred to passage in the book of Galatians. Galatians obviously has many more passages that are much more memorable. I don't think many of you probably have this embroidered on a pillow back at your house, sitting on your couch somewhere. 
this discussion about the spies that were sent to spy on Paul. And yet it is an interesting passage. It's one of those passages that kind of appeals to me because it's a, it's a working passage. It's a passage that's doing something. It's, it's kind of helping Paul as he's developing this argument, this lesson that he's bringing to the Galatians. Now, if we go back to the beginning of the letter, you don't have to take my word for it, but if you've read Galatians, you know this, that when Paul opens the letter, he's writing to a church that knows him intimately. He knows them. They know him. They, they, they cared for him. They watched over him. He introduced them to Jesus Christ through the gospel. And many of them owe their salvation to Paul's witnessing of the gospel. It's even interesting here, isn't it, that he talks about Barnabas, but he doesn't have to say who Barnabas is. They already seem to know. It's quite possible, actually, that this, that this Galatian church was converted during that first missionary journey that Paul and Barnabas did together. Paul, Paul can just mention, hey, Barnabas was there with me too. And they go, oh, we, we know Barnabas. We know all about him. So this is a close relationship, but I would point out something else. At the very beginning of the letter, Paul is very clear. This is not a gentle, um, soft letter. <laughs> This is a letter of alarm and of worry. This is a letter of Paul going to the Galatians saying, I know we gave you the gospel. When I was with you, I know what we preached. We preached Christ and him crucified alone. It wasn't through my wonderful speech. I'm not a sophist. I'm not a great rhetorician. I'm not a politician. I just came and I gave you Jesus. And you've already begun to go astray from the gospel that I taught you. And so Paul is writing to them a warning. Why are you deserting the faith? Why are you turning away from the gospel of Christ crucified that Barnabas and I gave to you? Now it's interesting. This is where our passage comes in. He's, he's developing this, this argument that they've gone from what was true gospel to false gospel. And in doing so, as he's doing it, he's, he's referring back to this event that took place years after he was there when he was referring back to going to Jerusalem, this visit that he had done to Jerusalem where he met with the major pillars of the Christian church. That is the apostles themselves. Notice, by the way, it's kind of interesting who's mentioned here. We've got John, Peter, James. Think about that. If, 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 if you think about the New Testament and if we go with the church tradition that Mark is the gospel that's written at the behest of Peter. It's kind of Peter's gospel. Mark is his scribe. Of course, John is also likewise a gospel writer. Luke seems to be one who's with Paul. If, they, if we go with that, if we notice later in Luke Acts, Luke starts referring to himself in the first person as being someone who's with Paul. So maybe Luke is kind of Paul's gospel. But then notice we also have James there as well. It's interesting, isn't it, that apart from Hebrews, whoever the author of Hebrews is, and we don't know, and Matthew, we have basically the whole New Testament here gathered in Jerusalem to ask this question, what is the gospel? So Paul is referring back to this earlier story when he went to Jerusalem and he met with all of the apostles and it's, it raises some questions. First of all, where, when did this meeting take place? Is, is this like the Acts 15 meeting? That if we go back to Acts 15, we see there's a great church council where everyone gathered together to deal with this question of Gentiles becoming Christians. Is that when this meeting took place? Some scholars think that that's the case. After all, even in that meeting, if we go back and look at Acts 15, you've got Paul and Barnabas on one side. They're the ones who have gone out to the countryside. They see the Gentiles coming into the gospel community faster than the Jewish people are. And so they're seeing this influx of new Christians coming in from the Gentiles. They go back to Jerusalem, and there on the other side of the argument, we have James and Peter and others who are saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, what's, what's going on here? What is this gospel that you're teaching to the Gentiles. And so the whole gathering gets together and they vote. And like this meeting that Paul is describing, Paul and Barnabas, the side of the Gentiles, win. They win the debate. And the apostles send them off with this large 
church council mandate to allow the gospel, uh, the Gentiles rather, into the gospel community. So it's possible that this, this meeting that Paul is referring back to in Galatians 2 is a meeting that took place in Acts and is described in Acts 15. However, several other scholars point out, well, notice in Acts 15, the reason why Paul goes down to Jerusalem is because the church in Antioch has sent him there. If you notice in the passage that we just read, Paul said that he went down to Jerusalem, not because the church of Antioch had sent him, but because he'd had a personal revelation from the Lord to go down to Jerusalem. It's also interesting that in Acts 15, it's a very public church council. It's like a large general assembly of church leaders gathered together to debate this issue. And yet here, Paul's very clear, we met in private. Not only that, as we're going to see in the rest of the book, the opponents of Paul, the ones who are arguing for this kind of against the Gentiles being brought into the gospel community, at least without converting to Judaism first, We're going to see that they continue in their opposition against Paul after this meeting that he's describing here takes place. It's kind of hard to imagine that that would happen after the Acts 15 meeting that's described in Acts 15 where there's great church mandate comes out to allow the Gentiles in. So it's possible that this is actually a different meeting, that this is actually Paul referring back to this kind of private meeting that took place. We, we can pick from a couple of examples in Acts, including Acts 11, that describes a meeting where Paul does come in to Jerusalem and meets with apostles, and yet the Acts account doesn't tell us what this Galatians account is telling us. In a way, we're getting kind of like a little bit of the backstory to some of the tensions that were arising in the early church. That even before the Acts 15 council took place, that big public presbytery meeting, before that took place, Paul was already meeting with the other apostles and discussing the issues related to the Gentile believers who are coming into the church. Well, it raises the question then, what's the issue? What's the problem? I point out, by the way, Paul doesn't think this is a small issue. This is not a little issue that he's dealing with. As a matter of fact, he says here that if I'm wrong on this issue, O Galatian church, if I'm wrong on what the nature of the gospel is, this is not a small thing, but that means that I have been laboring in vain, that that the work that I have been doing is for nothing. It's empty. It's worthless. You see, Paul saw that this issue that he was dealing with amongst the apostles was not a light issue. This is not something around which reasonable Christians can disagree whether or not we should have drums and worship or something like this. This is a central issue to the gospel. I point out, too, that Paul honors the accountability of the apostles, but he does it in his own Pauline way. Do you notice how he says three times, those who seem to be influential, he's talking about the apostles of Jesus Christ, those who, who seemed to be influential, though, though they were nothing special, they were no different from me, I was also called by Jesus himself. It's interesting that throughout the New Testament, three different times we get Paul's conversion and calling story. Paul was clear throughout his writings Twice in the book of Acts itself, Paul's clear to tell people, I was called by Jesus too. I'm not a secondary apostle. I'm not some kind of sub-apostle or some, some other kind of assistant. I am amongst those, though born at the wrong time, who was called to proclaim the gospel by Jesus Christ himself. I saw the risen Lord. So it's interesting here how Paul handles it. He has this kind of balance, doesn't he? He says, they seem influential, but God shows no partiality. They're no closer to God than you or I are. And yet, notice what Paul also says. He says, I went to them. He was held accountable by them. He recognized that if the gospel that he was proclaiming was a true gospel, then the other apostles would be able to confirm that calling as well. By the way, the kind of dynamic that we're seeing here very much reflects the sort of Presbyterian church government, just a side point, uh, that we see in Presbyterian churches. We don't see hierarchy as something where people are closer. The pastor's no closer to God than the members of the church are. It's not like he's somehow closer within the veil of holiness or something like that, but rather there there is a structure, there is an accountability 
for our leadership, and yet we also recognize that God shows no partiality. In Christ's church, there are two people. There is Jesus and all those who are saved by him. This is not a hierarchy of people being closer or of more value or of more, or of more you know, higher status in Christ's kingdom. So Paul mentions here that there are these opponents, these people who have sent in spies to undermine his ministry, and that they were a part of this council that was going on in Acts. It raises the question, what do these spies believe? What do these people believe who are bringing in this false gospel that Paul is going to tell the Galatians that they are also at risk of falling into? Now, their belief is probably something like this. We have to read between the lines to see what it is that they're dealing with. But it seems to be something like this. These people were taking something that was happening out there in the church, and they were mistaking that for the way it should be. Let me explain what I mean by that. They were noting that the early Christians were Jewish people primarily, and Gentiles who had already converted in to Judaism, people who were referred to as the God-fearers. You might even remember Jesus when Jesus is ministering in Jerusalem. Most of the people who are following him are his fellow Judeans. But then you also have these God-fearers, people like the Syrophoenician woman, right, who has greater faith than all of Israel according to Christ. Or the centurions who come and speak with him and are converted. But they already seem to be honoring and reading the Old Testament law. It seems as if some of these Christians, some of these leaders early on said, so that actually gives us a model for salvation. If you want to come to Jesus as a Gentile, what you need to do is first convert to Judaism. You need to observe Torah. You need to observe the kosher laws. You need to come and live like Jewish people live according to the Old Testament. And then once you've done that, once you've been circumcised and you're now living out this Jewish life, then you can convert to Jesus Christ. To put it another way, they might say, yes, it is possible for a Gentile to be saved in Jesus, but in order to do that, they must also perform proper Jewish practices, circumcision, kosher laws, observing the cleanliness codes. Some commentators point out that this is obviously a kind of cultural bigotry, There's something about how you have to convert first to sort of Jewish culture before you can convert to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I want to point out that's not exactly what's going on here. This isn't so much about a sort of cultural hierarchy of supremacy. What's going on here is people are actually looking at salvation in kind of a biblical theological way, but they're making an error. They're saying, well, look, I look around me. I I see Naaman in the Old Testament, right? He's a Gentile who gets converted to Judaism. I see Ruth. I see Rahab. Uh, How about Uriah the Hittite? He's a Hittite after all, and yet he's been converted into Yahwistic faith. Surely that must mean that all Gentiles must first convert into Judaism before they convert to Jesus Christ. So what's the error that they're making? I want to argue that the error is threefold. That they, they make three main errors. They misunderstand who Jesus is. Secondly, they misunderstand what Jesus does. And thirdly, they misunderstand the nature of faith. First of all, they misunderstand who Jesus is. Is. They don't understand the totality of Jesus. They're, they're seeing him as just another prophet. He's like another Isaiah. He, he's another Jeremiah. Maybe he's even like another Moses. As great as Moses, he speaks with that kind of authority. But they don't understand that Jesus is not just another step. He's not just another prophet. He is the summa. He is the totality. He is the reference point of all of redemptive history. They don't understand that every covenant of the Old Testament, every person in the Old Testament, every hero of the faith in the Old Testament, go read Hebrews 11 to see how the author of Hebrews says the same thing. They all succeeded if they succeeded because of Jesus Christ. Every other aspect of the Old Testament law points to the person of Jesus. They misunderstand who Jesus is. 
But they don't just misunderstand that. They misunderstand what Jesus does. They misunderstand the work of Jesus. They don't realize that before Jesus came, humanity had been made over and over and over again painfully aware of its inability to save itself. Ever since the garden, we'd been trying to come up with ways to cover over our shame, to atone for our sin, to somehow bring ourselves back to communion with God. And every single time we failed, it was baked into the law itself. The law was there, as we already discussed this morning, the law was there to show us how far we fell from saving ourselves. Think even about the cleanliness codes, the uh, the rules about how you ought to live, the rules that by your unbelieving friends as you're talking to them about the gospel, they say, really, you you believe the whole Bible? Even those parts about eating certain kinds of foods and, and, and whether or not you can sew certain kinds of cloths together? Think about even those codes, those cleanliness codes from the Old Testament. No matter how well you observed those codes, no matter how well you measured the food that you ate, no matter how careful you were about the clothes that you wore or staying away from dead bodies or staying away from people who were ill, no matter how careful you were, this still happened every single time you came to commune with God in the temple. Every time you came with your sacrifice to present yourself to God, what would happen? Were you worthy to give the sacrifice? Absolutely not. Every single Israelite, even the most righteous, had to come and hand his sacrifice over to a priest. By the way, even the priests themselves, even if you were the cleanest Levitical, Aaronic priest and you're going in to bring the sacrifice on the Day of Atonement, are you able to then go into the presence of God? Absolutely not. Even they needed to have a high priest who could go before them. You see, the whole law told them over and over again, no matter how hard you try, no matter how hard you struggle, no matter how hard you try to scrape your way into the presence of God, there will always be one more thing you need to do. You see, they misunderstood what Jesus had done. Because if not for Christ, we all would be condemned under those cleanliness codes. If not for Christ, we would all be condemned under the moral law, under the Ten Commandments, under Deuteronomy that we read earlier today. We all fall short, even the very best of us. If not, if not for the very best of us. Because that's what Jesus Christ is after all, right? He is truly human. He is the very best of us. He paid it all. He fulfilled it all. He cleansed us all. He made straight the way through his active righteousness, through his active giving up of himself on the cross in our stead. He freed the captives. He healed the sick. He made alive the dead. He is indeed the answer, as the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1.20, he is the answer to all of the promises of that old covenant. It's interesting to see how the apostles talk about Jesus. We might expect them to say, well, Jesus fulfills all of the priestly things that are required of us in the Old Testament. But notice they don't say that. Paul says all covenantal promises are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. We might expect Jesus to say, well, I I have authority over my people. That's who I have authority over, all, all the people who believe in me by faith. But notice Jesus doesn't say that. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. It's all authority. We might say, well, Jesus is a good representation. He's a good picture of who God is. But notice, that's not what the apostles they say. They say, he is the exact embodiment of the Godhead. You see, if we miss who Jesus is, and if we miss what Jesus does, then we miss the gospel itself. Lastly, these opponents of Paul misunderstand not just who Jesus is and what he does, they misunderstand what faith in Jesus looks like. It's not one of many works. Faith is not one of the latest works that you've done. You tried to, you got circumcised, you obeyed the law, you tried to be a friendly, loving person, you took care of the poor, the sojourner and the widow. Oh, and then on top of that, you also had faith. That's not how faith works. It's not one more step in righteousness, but rather it's the only step 
It's the only thing. It's the only necessary condition for your salvation. It's the only proper response. And even it itself is a gift from God. Paul's very clear about this. He says in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is the hard part. And this too is not by your own doing. It's not like you're just a little bit smarter than your unbelieving friend. It's not that you just have a little bit more spiritual insight than the neighbor next to you who doesn't accept Jesus. Even your faith is a gift from God. Even your faith is a gift so that no one can boast. We read from Westminster earlier today, and I'd like to draw our attention back. This is the Westminster, the the drafters of the the Westminster Assembly documents commenting on Ephesians chapter 2, 8 that I just read. They say this, though this faith is in us, yet it is not of us. That is not by the power of nature, but that it is merely a gift of God, and this is meant not only of the habit of faith, but of the very act of faith. In other words, he's saying it's not just that you're living out your faith that's a gift of God. It's the very fact that you have faith is a gift of God. See, faith cannot be seen as just one other work to add to our litany of good works. It's the only thing that saves us, and it itself is a gift from God. It's interesting that in this passage, the apostles send Paul off agreeing with them. And we we got a hint that they were going to agree with him because they accepted in Titus without making Titus get circumcised first. And now they send off Paul to go out and to do his ministry. And he says, you can do it. Keep it up. Don't stop. Oh, by the way, don't forget about the poor. (laughs) Some people think that that might be because the church in Jerusalem was relatively poor, whereas these Gentile churches out in the countryside were relatively wealthy. And so they're saying, by the way, don't forget about us, Paul, now that we've affirmed uh, your gospel ministry. That's possible, but I actually think there's something more going on here. It's something that we even saw in Deuteronomy that we read earlier today, and we see it in Jesus' ministry himself. You are saved by your faith alone. You are saved by that gift of faith to you that transforms you. And yet everywhere we look in the Old Testament and in the New, the very first fruit of that faith that ought to sprout out of you is that you also care for those who are as lacking and as poor and as in need as you are. Jesus himself in Matthew 25 says, I will judge you by your faith. In the end times, when you stand before me, I will judge you by your faith. And how will I know whether or not you believe in my kingdom? Because of how you treated me when I came to you. And they will say, when did you come to us, Lord? And you'll say, when the poor came to you, when the homeless, when, the, when those who were naked, when those who were hungry came to you, that was my kingdom coming to you. Rome comes to you with an army with spears and, and armor and swords and battle. I come to you in the poor. And that's how you show the faith that you have within yourself by caring for the poor amongst you, the widow, the sojourner, and the orphan. So it's perhaps not surprising that the apostles leave Paul with the same mandate. All right, I want to close with this. What do we then get out of all of this? What does this mean for us as we're considering Paul's experience here in Galatians, referring back to this meeting in Jerusalem? Well, first of all, I'd point this out. Opposition to the gospel is often rational and conspiratorial. We have to remember that. I had a good friend who said, if I could just show people who Jesus really was, they they would love him like I love him. But as we get acquainted with the teaching of the New Testament, we find out that people can see exactly who Jesus is, and it will make them offended. It will make them upset. Jesus himself could preach to multitudes, and they would turn away and reject him. Would we say it's because he didn't do it right? No, of course he did. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ is offensive. Our job is not to add to the offense. I'd also point this out. Your calling should be confirmed. Notice that Paul even recognizes this. He says there's no hierarchy amongst Christians. It's not like the apostles are a little bit better than we are or something like that. And yet, my calling does need to be confirmed. 
If you have a message of the gospel to give to people, then you ought to be confirmed and held accountable and not be afraid of accountability by the church. But then lastly, we should learn this, that we are saved by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone, not by works, not by cultural trappings, not by any other loyalty that we might bring to the table. There's a deep human tendency towards earning our salvation, towards what we might call legalisms, by creating laws to bring about our salvation. There are legalisms that are based around moral living. We might call that moralism. People who try to just be just moral enough that you might earn your salvation. But that's not the only kind of legalism that humans fall into. Even Christians can fall into. There's moralism. But there's also a legalism that's kind of based around cultural trappings and cultural identification. We call that bigotry, right? You need to be a follower of Jesus, but you also need to follow properly the certain cultural values and preferences that we all observe. I have the the pleasure of working in a seminary that serves uh, ministers in North Africa and the Middle East, and the the two things you have to do to come to this seminary is you have to be a convert from Islam, and you have to be an Arabic speaker, and you have to be a pastor. And we found very early on that one of the classes we had to have was a class that was called Absolutes, Convictions, and Preferences, okay? Okay. And when we found in this class that the absolutes, the things like this, Jesus is Lord, right? Those are, those are important. We can't disagree on those. Those are the heart of the gospel. Convictions are a little different. It's not that they're unimportant, but they're the things that reasonable Christians can disagree around. See, baptism, perhaps, maybe uh, the continuance of the gifts, things that reasonable Christians can disagree upon. But then you get to preferences, What kind of clothes should you wear? How should you act? How should you talk? What should your music look like in worship? These are preferences. These aren't the convictions. These aren't the absolutes. And what we all recognize, and this is in North Africa, the Middle East, and let me tell you, it's the same in the United States of America. Most church conflicts revolve around those preferences. It's not around the absolutes. It's not around the convictions. Oh, that it were so. (laughs) Oh, if that's what the thing that we wrapped ourselves up with. But no, it's usually the preferences. We have to be careful of cultural preference and mistaking cultural preference for the heart of the gospel message. So there are three different kinds of legalisms, moralism, bigotry, and the last one is probably the one I think in the Reformed world we most often fall into. That is the legalism of rationalism. That we somehow earn our reward by a commitment to a set of intellectual principles, concepts, and formulations. This might even be the thing that drew you to a Reformed church like CCC. How well the gospel of Jesus Christ is articulated and made sense of and explained in the broader sense of the teaching and the word, the extent, the whole counsel of God. By the way, this is a beautiful thing. It is a good thing to have a strong and robust Christian doctrine. And yet we need to also remember that I am saved and you are saved by Jesus alone through faith, by faith alone, not because you can articulate clearly the doctrines of the Reformed tradition. You see, what Paul is articulating here and what he did articulate to those Judaizers in Acts in Jerusalem when he met with them, he articulated to them this idea that the gospel is incredibly universal, it is equaling, and it is truly transformative. It is based completely in the person and the work of Jesus Christ, and we cannot merit our own salvation. St. Augustine said this, the sufficiency of my merit is to know that my merit is not sufficient. (laughs) That's all that your good works do, is they show you how they can't save you. Another Christian voice from the past, John Wycliffe, said this. He called Christians to trust wholly in Christ, rely altogether on his sufferings, beware of seeking to be justified in any other way than by his righteousness. Faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, Wycliffe writes, is sufficient alone for salvation. 
So let me close with this, brothers and sisters. If you're exhausted, if you're fatigued, if you are tired of this obsessive activity of trying to scrape your way into the presence of God, of watching every single thing you do so that you might merit audience in his kingdom, if you're tired of this illusion of your own self-righteousness because deep down you know what Paul also knew and what Jesus Christ told us about ourselves, which is that our merit cannot save us, I want to encourage you in this. Go to God the Father who loves to give generously and ask him. Ask him to give you a spirit of trust in Christ alone, to trust in him wholly. Ask God to make you righteous because of Christ's righteousness and that that would be imputed upon you by faith. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do lift up this teaching of the gospel that is so beautiful and it's so freeing and it's so transformative and you know us and you know it's also hard if not for the gift of grace through Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would be present with each one of us, Lord, drawing us to you, that we would see you afresh and that we would sing now and worship now and say that Jesus Christ is Lord and that we would mean it because the Spirit of Christ is saying it within us. We offer this up in his name. Amen.